In this short presentation, I'll look at the great Isaac Newton, as revealed through a few pieces of his correspondence, and share a personal anecdote about his greatest written statement. Newton was born in 1642, lived until 1727. He was, throughout his life, a introverted person called a sober, silent, thinking lad as a child. His academic career was spent at Trinity College, Cambridge, this most beautiful site uh, in England where he was both a student and a professor. Now, throughout his career, he argued that he should not get involved in disputes with other individuals, particularly written ones. For instance, in September of 1682, he sends a letter to William Briggs in which he says, I am of all men grown the most shy of setting pen to paper about anything that may lead into disputes. Newton was always arguing he shouldn't get into disputes, yet he got into all sorts of disputes uh, with others. Here's an example. Um, in May of 1686, Edmund Halley, of Comet fame, uh, tells Newton that down in London, Robert Hooke, the famous British scientist, is claiming priority for something called the inverse square law of gravity, and Hooke is demanding that he be cited in Newton's Principia Mathematica. Now, a little background here. The, the inverse square law is the way gravity works, according to Newton. It's the foundation of his mechanics. Using this, he describes how the planets move, how the comets move, what he calls the system of the world. So this is the headline of his great work that he's preparing, the Principia Mathematica. And now he learns from Halley that Robert Hooke claims that he, Hooke, thought up this law and should be cited in the Principia. Well, Newton's having none of it, and he writes back to Halley these words. Now, is not this very fine, says Newton. Mathematicians who find out, settle, and do all the business must content themselves with being nothing but dry calculators and drudges. And another that does nothing but pretend to grasp at all things must carry away all the invention. Well, now, for somebody that doesn't want to get into written controversy, that's pretty controversial, as he claims that Hooke pretends to grasp the inverse square law. Newton sends this diatribe off to Halley, who immediately writes back and says, Sir, I must now again beg you not to let your resentments run so high. Newton's resentments would run very high. In fact, the next year he publishes the Principia Mathematica, and nowhere does he mention Robert Hooke. Hooke does not get the acclaim that he sought. Now, in the course of his life, Newton gets into controversies not only with Hooke, but with John Flamsteed, the astronomer royal at Greenwich Observatory, and in particular, most famously, with Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, the great German mathematician and philosopher uh, who, along with Newton, invents the calculus. So Newton is a man of many disputes. Yet, at the end of his life, near the end of his life, in 1721, Newton writes to Varignon, I have always avoided quarrels. Well. Not really. Okay, so that may be as Newton at his worst. Let me now tell you about Newton at his best, and that is the famous passage in which he says that if he's seen farther than others, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, a few years ago, I was reading the correspondence of Isaac Newton. I thought this would be a worthy summer venture. It uh, is published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, there are seven fat volumes and 3,000 pages. But in there, we have all the letters uh, Newton ever wrote. And if you go to the letter that he wrote to Robert Hooke on the 5th of February, 1675, you will find this great statement. Now, I should say that this is a decade and more before the little exchange I just mentioned with Hooke. Uh, where Hooke's claiming credit for the inverse square law. Back a, a decade earlier, the two men were still at loggerheads. There was still friction between them, but it wasn't as severe uh, as uh, it would later become. And in fact, in this letter uh, of February 1675, Newton seems to be trying to smooth over things, to try to smooth the waters with Hooke, with whom he'd had some friction already. So Newton begins this way. He says, 
There is nothing which I desire to avoid in matters of philosophy more than contention, nor any kind of contention more than one in print. So he doesn't want to get into an argument with Hooke in print. Okay, that's fair enough. And then Newton goes on in this letter to say something quite profound. He said, what's done before many witnesses is seldom without some further concern than that for truth. But what passes between friends in private usually deserves the name of consultation rather than contest. That's a very nice observation that maybe if we're just going to disagree, we'll do it in private, we'll, we will not contest, we will not have a, have a war. Okay, so that's nice. And then Newton goes on to say that if he has made great progress, it's because of those who came before. He says, what Descartes did was a good step. And then he says, you have added much several ways. That's Hooke. So Newton is being gracious to Hooke. And then comes the great passage. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Now, this is not only Newton's most famous writing, but it seems to me this could well be the most famous sentence in the history of science. This is how science works, right? We stand on the shoulders of our predecessors. So Archimedes stands on Euclid's shoulders, and Newton on Archimedes, and Euler on Newton's, and so on. It's, it's a kind of poetic statement that captures the essence of science and mathematics. Now, it is such a great statement that it shows up on the British money. Uh, if you go to England and you look at the two-pound coin, it, it's, a, it's a bimetallic, beautiful piece with gold and silver, uh, along the edge it says, standing on the shoulders of giants. There it is, the British honoring their great son Newton on their money with this famous passage on the edge. Well, when I read this in the correspondence, I, I, I thought, I, I wonder where this is. Where does this letter reside? Um, you know, I had guesses. I thought, well, maybe the British Library. If you go to the British Library, they have a room of great British documents. The Magna Carta is there. The first folio of Shakespeare is there. There's stuff from Dickens, Austin, and even the Beatles have a manuscript there. And what a great place to find Newton's greatest letter. But it's not there. Uh, or maybe at Cambridge, his, his alma mater. No. When I read this in the correspondence, the footnote says that this letter is in Philadelphia at a place called the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Well, I figured this must be wrong. This can't be. And so I sent an email to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. I said, do you have this? And they said, yeah. And I said, can I come and see it? And they said, sure. Well, I live near Philadelphia. So at my earliest opportunity, I get in the train, go down to Center City, get off near Independence Hall, and walk to this gorgeous building, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. I, when I clear security, I ask them to see the letter. Someone goes back into the back room. Out they come with a folder. I open it, and there is the letter. Uh, the original letter, the original parchment, the original ink that Newton set down. And it's easy to imagine him writing uh, by candlelight this letter to Hook. It, it's, it's an awesome feeling to hold this. And about two-thirds of the way down the page, there it is the great passage, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, Newton's great metaphor. So I, I communed with this uh, letter for a while, and then it was time to hand it back. It goes back into its lair somewhere in the back room. But there's one remaining question. How in the world did this letter end up in Philadelphia instead of in England? So I asked them, and it turned out that it's part of the Simon Gratz autograph collection. Gratz was a Philadelphia industrialist. He collected signatures of famous people. He had signatures of Washington and Napoleon, and he wanted one of Newton. And so the letter he purchased to get Newton's signature happened to be the letter with Newton's great line in it. And, but in a certain sense, what Gratz was looking for when he collected this was not so much uh, the standing on the shoulders of giants sentence, but the signature at the bottom which is on the back of the, of the letter, and it's signed, Your Humble Servant, Isaac Newton. So for that reason, the letter is and it will always remain in Philadelphia, while the rest of us will stand on those broad shoulders of Isaac Newton. <laughs>